AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. This is Aubrey Edwards. It's my special guest co-host, Alex Eberhentes. Hello, Alex. How are you? Hello, Aubrey. I'm doing fantastic. Thanks again for having me. Of course, of course. So I want to start this podcast off with an apology because I called our guests ass boys on Twitter. I called them the gun club. I'm just getting everything wrong. And I love both of these boys so much with all of my heart. And I've been uh, lucky to be a part of their careers, their blossoming careers. So first off, guys, apologies. We have Austin and Colton, the guns, here today. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. And also, do um, do we get an apology for being in the company for so long and never being on this podcast? Mm. Yes, no, you, no, also no, get, no. <laughs> you also get an apology <laughs> for get... that. Okay, good. Do we get an apology? Strike one, ass boy. Strike two, gun club. Strike three, just being here since day one and not being respected enough to be on your podcast. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, Jeez. Uh, do we, do we end this now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe that's strike three right there. Let's get out of here. Uh, well, well you've been oh, listening they, to AEW oh, Unrestricted. <laughs> they got well, dad on. That's all that matters. Oh, it's yeah. funny. I got a, a legal letter from, I guess, Stokely saying that I cannot refer to you uh, in any type of negative connotation. So I can't call you by the name that Aubrey called you, apparently, on Twitter. Uh, so hopefully that'll bring you some comfort knowing that you'll be respected throughout this entire podcast. Yeah. And I mean, Good. another thing is we have the trademark on that, so we can sue you if you use it. Mm, wow. Good oh. to know. Good to know. So, All right. <laughs> All right. Didn't think Let's about that, legal. did you? Let's get legal in here, you know? <laughs> we actually haven't had Mega on the podcast. That would be an interesting one, just as a side note. But yeah, I was uh, I was talking to Stacy, our producer, and I was like, wait a minute. How have we not have Austin and Colton on here? And I think maybe just because we had your dad so early that I was just like, oh, yeah, we've had Billy because I lump you guys in all the time because you guys travel all the time together and you work out together and all of these things. And we'll we'll get into that. Um, but first off, I want to talk about because there's there's been so much evolution to your guys' team and your characters and who you guys have been, especially like very recently in the last few weeks. Um, I want to talk about why why you guys decided to drop club from your name. Um, because it was, now there's... It was oh, a, go ahead, Oz. Yeah, it was a name that when me and my dad started together as a tag team, I was like, what are we going to be called? I don't know. We're, 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 I mean, we're about to go do my first match and we don't even have a name. And he goes, what about the gun club? And I was like, uh, all right, cool. And then we just did that for the first match and then it literally stuck with us for three years. And the entire time I was like, this is... To me, I was like, this is goofy. I didn't want it to like represent anything else. Maybe like New Japan esque, uh, the Bullet Club, and you have all these clubs. And I was like, I was like, nah, this is not it. And then for three years, we had to stick with that. But then when me and Colton turned on him, I was like, it's time for me and Colton to kind of take charge of not only our characters, but our career as well. I was like, we no longer live under the shadow of my dad. So I was like, let's just go with the guns. It's cleaner, it's more precise, and it's more serious. So, yeah, and it's mm. not a club. It's not a club anymore. There's only two of us. So, That's yeah. True. yeah. So you went from being a club to being referred to as something else from Danhausen. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about how this all came to be? Because this wasn't something that was necessarily planned, right? But just caught wildfire and uh, has become part of, you know, your history. I mean, like me and Austin like to say, we got that guy a job, you know, like he was nothing <laughs> before mm. he decided to call us no. some name. And all of a sudden he's, you know, super popular on Twitter. So, I mean, I'm waiting for him to give me some cut of his contract would be nice. But yeah, we were on the cruise. We were on the Chris Jericho cruise and we've never done one before. So we went out there and we were having matches and we did a comedy event. And Dan Housen came up to us and was like, hey, uh, nice to meet you guys. I've been following your careers. Do you guys mind coming out and doing this thing with your dad? And I was like, oh, no, sure. No problem. We'll, we'll do that for you. So we came out there and he didn't tell us that he was going to call us ass boys and he was going to reference dad as daddy ass. And it caught wildfire, like you said, Alex. And then when we went out the next morning for our match on the cruise, the entire boat was chanting ass boys. I was like, wait, this this can only be a boat Chris Jericho thing. All right, let them have their fun. It doesn't matter to us. And then once we touched down on land and we got cell phone service again, it was all over Twitter. When we came back to AEW and we had a dark match on Elevation, 
the entire arena started chanting it. And then from there, it just escalated into this big mountain. And now we can't get away from it and we can't backtrack. It's like, it's, it's so annoying. It's annoying. It's, you, I mean, you say it's annoying, but it's one of those things that's like, I think it's really cool because one, I thought everything on the boat was just going to stay on the boat. So the fact that this got so big that it made it back to like land is insane. And I think a testament to who you guys are. I'm trying to spin this in a positive way uh, to who you guys are, that you connect with the audience, that they find something they want to cheer for you guys, especially given like the history with your dad, how people love cheering things when your dad comes out with the whole suck it thing. So I think it's really cool. I, I know you guys don't like it. But I think it's really cool just given that you have this this part of you and this this chant that people have. And despite despite the fact that, you know, you don't like it, I think it's a testament to how great you guys are. So meh, that's that's my thing. Uh, so thank you, Rod and Todd, to ask for being here today. This uh, is unbelievable. Okay. All right. Racism. Careful. <laughs> Careful, Aubrey. <laughs> I, 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 I think we'll be OK. I think we'll still be friends at the end. of Yeah. This. But do you think that me and Colton wanted to come into this business and and uh like we we're trying to solidify a legacy and we're second generation oh, yeah. and there's a lot of mm. pressure on us do you think we ever want to be called ass boys or think that this is w the way our career was going so that's oh, why no. it annoys us so much because we work too hard we've been here since day one thanks for having us on our podcast finally and it's just like <laughs> now we're being called ass boy every single week and we being cold we're in the LaGuardia airport yesterday just trying to have a good day in security guards there was a group of three security guards that passed by us and they were like ass boys ignore them ignore them that's oh, all we can do is ignore them wow. so maybe yeah, the more we the, ignore them yeah. the more they'll stop so i'm getting off the plane the flight attendant under his best like <laughs> ass boy like, oh, i'm just trying to it, it, it's everywhere yeah, i'm trying to enjoy a that's nice flight <laughs> you know we've been traveling everywhere and i gotta deal with this kind of stuff this is my yeah. life you know what kind of advice did your dad give you when you were talking to your dad? What type of advice did he give you about this? Did he say embrace it or, you know, what did he say? That's part yeah, of the of problem with him. Yeah, so he's friends. <laughs> yeah, he's in friends with Danhausen and loves it and tells us to embrace <laughs> the ass. And you can see where the cracks started to form between us because of that. Oh, I see a crack. All right. The ass mm -hmm. crack. But it's like, <laughs> but, his, his, but his entire career, he was known as Mr. Ass. So when his boys are being referenced as ass boys, it doesn't get us more popular. It's just a reminder that, oh, hey, they still remember me. I'm still relevant. I'm 58 years old. I'm in the business still. Like, please give me all that I want. Give me all the attention. And that's yeah. the one, one of the reasons the we camera? turned on him. Yeah. Where's the camera? He just hogs everything. And you've yeah, seen it, Aubrey. He wants to dance I've with you in it. the ring. He wants to take the mm. spotlight. Like, this is our time. He's very greedy. Like, just take a back seat. Take a back seat. He can't do it. He has to be shotgun. Always. <laughs> okay so right. you guys have have another name associated with you now you're now the firm you're along with mjf and stokely and all these other guys uh how's life been so far as part of the firm i mean for oh, me and austin what? it's, it's been great i mean me and austin just got back from new york fashion week one week after oh. we joined the firm we're front mm. row vip at new york fashion week we're getting dressed by designers i mean life couldn't be better right now the firm has given us unlimited opportunities and we are we are hollywood you know yeah well how does it Somebody feel out. go ahead i'm sorry austin no no i was just gonna get, expand on that i was shooting dms new york fashion week i have a blue check by my name i am part of the firm what's up i'm here representing the firm here i'm representing AEW. i'm shooting dms to every single model at lingerie shows i'm coming off I'm coming off a reality TV show. There's nothing we'll that, that the guns can't do, mm -hmm. but it's now finally time for somebody to realize our potential. And we're not just we're not just in this company to lose matches and get other people open. No, like the guns are 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 winning the tag team champion belts. Like that's what we're doing. The firm can help us get us there. That's what we're gonna do. And we're surrounded. Yeah, and we're surrounded by like-minded people. You got Ethan Page, Lee Moriarty, Big Cat. You know, they've we've been we've been kind of overlooked the whole time we're in AEW, and now that we're together, we are literally going to take this whole company over, and every single person is going to get what Stokely said in that promo, and they're all going to get it, and that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Well, while you guys were busy sliding into DMs, your dad was busy helping the acclaimed win the AEW Tag Team Championships on uh, at Grand Slam. How did that make you guys feel? 
So I want to say one thing about this. Everyone, everyone thinks like the acclaimed are the good guys here. And if you look at it, they are not like when Bowens went down hurt, who came and was a friend to Max Caster and helped him and wrestled with him. Oh, that would be me in Austin. But yeah. he kept wanting to call us ass boys in his rap. And then Bowens from his little wheelchair was calling us ass boys and trying to get the crowd to chant that. And then when he finally got better, he hit my brother in the head with a crutch to cost us the match. The- mm, and then, and then they take their dad, their dad away from two loving boys and we're the bad guys. Like yeah. I just had to get that <laughs> off my chest. Those guys are the worst, the worst. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Aust- but seeing Austin, him out do you have there, any thoughts to add on that? No, it's just like, I don't know. You, I'm, I've been with dad since the beginning of my career, since 2017, 2018-ish. He's the one that trained me. And um, we developed this bond. And then Colton decided to come back from California and, and give this a go. And, oh, what do you know? He's super athletic and, and grew up around this business. And then we started this bond, the gun club, going out there every single night. And then just when the acclaim got into the picture, we teamed up because we thought we'd be a cohesive unit. And then just like Colton said, like doing doing the raps and then and then making the whole entire arena chant ass boys, it's like it, it becomes like a sort of it's disrespect. It's at a certain point, it's disrespect. And then it's just like, then you see your dad, like it, it, he physically grabbed me. He's never done this before. Grabbed me and pulled me off the acclaim. It's just like, it's like things started to switch in his brain. And then it, me and Colton clicked and it was just like, I don't know, man. It, it, does it hurt seeing them win the tag team belts? Yeah. But I can't wait to see Billy's face when we come and take them right off him. And it's going to oh. be awesome. It's going to mm. be the greatest moment of my career getting to look him in the eyes when I pin either Bowens or Caster one, two, three in the middle of the ring and go, see, see, made the wrong decision there. Pops, Billy. Wow. Pops, Billy. Uh, that, that, it's, you know it's, it's personal bad. now. You know, it's bad when you start calling dad by the real name. So, Oh yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh boy. I haven't, um, I haven't called him dad since he hasn't even talked to me. So I don't oh know. Oh my God. Okay. So I, I know you're, you're on, you know, bad terms with your dad right now but i do want to talk about austin your your debut uh was january uh 2020 pre-pandemic uh you and billy debuted as the gun club defeating peter avalon sean spears and i think you suffered a torn pcl in the match i actually suffered that during my debut match which was a was a dark dark match in jacksonville homecoming um, and then the, I believe the next week after that, um, it was against Peter Avalon and Sean it was, Spears. it was, it was, Spe- yes, Sean Spears and Peter Avalon. That was my official one that actually went online. So after I got signed, uh, the next week they gave me another opportunity to show everything. And I was like, man, my knee is, my knee is not holding up really well. And, uh, I found out like a month later that it was a PCL. I had a torn PCL the entire time. So, um, yeah, that was hard to get through, but uh, yeah, it was a it was a great debut. And then the week after that, I had that match, so I just got it taken care of. And then I got injured, and then that's how we go into the the crowd. Can you uh, can you talk about the recovery for that injury? Yeah, it sucks. I mean, I've had a, a ACL injury in my left knee when I played lacrosse at Rollins College, um, and uh, that was the first time I ever knew about knee injuries or anything was wrong with my body. Cause I tried to play right after. And she goes, no, my trainer was like banging my helmet on the ground. She was like, stop trying to get it up. Your ACL is completely torn. So once I went mm-hmm. through six months of recovery for that, it obviously, uh, uh, delayed my wrestling process of been trying to train with my dad and trying to get me ready. Um, and then when I went and when I was fully recovered, I, I, I got down to 200 pounds. I was, I was ripped. I was ready to go for my debut. And then I did a frog splash and I felt something pop in my left knee again. And I was like, damn. So the next week I got an MRI and everything like that. And, uh, our doctors at AEW said I had a torn PCL, but thankfully a torn PCL, there's enough blood flow in the back of your knee, uh, to, it just kind of heals itself over time. If you do the right, uh, physical training for it, then you're good. So like right now I'm, I'm hundred percent good. I didn't have to have surgery on that, uh, but I have tor- torn both both ACLs. So it was like, just anything that comes with knee injuries is just not fun. But uh, I stuck with it and went through physical training, and now we're back. 
Very cool. And, and Colton, correct me if I'm wrong, you started a little bit later, right? Was your goal always to get into wrestling? Because if I recall, you were pursuing other opportunities and decided to get into wrestling. Yeah, I was never really, uh, I didn't think I wanted to be in wrestling. I, you know, graduated from college with two majors and then I just went straight into the corporate world and I moved to LA and was building custom houses out there for like three years. And I remember one day just being in my trailer and I was just watching dad and Austin. I was watching AEW every week and I was just thinking of things we could do and like moves and what we could call it, what our promos would be. And I was just sitting there and I was like, okay, I'm thinking about this way too much. If I'm 50 and I never gave it a try, I am going to be so regretful and I didn't want that feeling. So I actually went to Rikishi's school. I didn't tell my dad. I didn't tell anyone. And I just went by myself and I was telling Rikishi, I said, hey, don't let anybody know who I am. Like, I just want to come in and just see how I feel. I came in and everyone immediately knew who I was. I guess well, you, me and my you dad look, look not. You look like... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I did that. And then I called my dad after and he's like, what the hell? Why did you do that? Yada, yada. And he's like, if you want to do this, just come home. So I took two weeks off of work. I flew to Orlando, went to Sean Spears and Tyler Breeze class. And we had a sit down talk. And it's like, if you want to do this 110%. And I said, I 110% do. So I went back to LA. I quit my job and drove back to Orlando and started training. And then Damn. 12 weeks after that, I was on AEW Dark. <laughs> so, yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah. This was, it was a whirlwind, whirlwind adventure to get you there. And uh, yeah. we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. We're going to talk about the pandemic, more wrestling, more of your guys' background coming up here on AEW Unrestricted. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey and Alex talking to the guns. Colton and Austin, a little bit about wrestling, a little bit about the betrayal that they've recently had in their mm. family, all of these, mm -hmm. all of these important and touchy topics. But uh, I, I want to go back and talk about Austin and his incredible work during the pandemic. Uh, I think it's it's impossible to talk about that era of AEW without talking about <laughs> how important Austin's work in the crowd was because we yeah. had no crowd. And oftentimes, after hours and hours of taping, Austin would be the only one still like, come on, guys, hit him with the deal. Like, all of this stuff. And he was the one that was helping us get through everything. So, uh, Austin, what was that that period of time like? Uh, so, referencing back, I had a torn PCL, so I wasn't able to, to wrestle in the ring. And me and Dad were at a taping, and um, actually, it was in Atlanta the first, I think the yep. first pandemic kind of style mm -hmm. match was in Atlanta. We tried to set up shop there at the Nightmare Factory. And I was like, man, I'm going to be here for like eight hours watching wrestling. I was like, I'd at least want to be out in the crowd, like at least like giving them support and um, helping them out in any way I could. So me and Dad made water bottles filled with nails that we found in like the corner. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I've seen this at like soccer games. We could do this. So me and Colton went out in the – or me and dad went out in the crowd at that time. And we were yelling at the top of our lungs, just making each other laugh, having fun, making the people in the ring feel like there was a crowd atmosphere there. And everybody else that was sitting next to us was like, hey, Ooh. right? But me, me and dad were going insane, trying to reach Did over you? the railing, trying to touch the oh, yeah. and everything. So then when it transitioned over to Jacksonville, I was like, oh, this is kind of like my niche right now. I was like, I was like, people are like backstage are like, man, that really helped me. You were losing your mind out there. I don't know how much energy you, you can like sustain for that long. So over time, it, it was more just like uh, when the opening of the show happened, one of the camera guys would have their camera right here in my face and a red dot would pop up and I'd be the opening of the show. Me and dad would go, yeah, welcome to AEW, mm. baby. Right. And it went from elevation to dynamite to rampage and just like i was screaming my ass off for 14 hours and i just wanted people at home to feel like there was a crowd and that they could cheer along with us and like trying to trying to help them uh just just feel more at home with wrestling it's very weird in an empty arena wrestling and it's just like ah oh, if nobody else is into it i'm not going to be into it and I was 110% into it. Me and dad had fun. We would make signs. We'd wear shirts. I'd take my shirt off. I'd be like in a soccer arena, like doing chants and making up chants for people. And it was just, it was very helpful for our talent. But it was also in my head, I was like, you know what? 
usually people try and get more popular in the wrestling ring. Oh, I can do this move and become really popular and known for that. I was like, maybe I show the people my personality first. So when I step back into the ring in a year, maybe they'll already know who I am. And over time, they were like, I was reading Twitter the first couple of weeks. And I was, they were like, oh, who the hell is that annoying ass kid in front row? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's standing next to Billy Gunn. I think that's Billy Gunn's kid, right? And I was already signed at the time. I was like, oh, everybody knows who I am, <laughs> right? But they didn't. So over time on Twitter, they're like, dude, I can't wait to watch Austin Gunn front row. Like, this is going to be sick. So over a year, I just built up a whole, like, fan base of, like, people that loved watching me in the crowd. I'd take Sheeta's robe and just, like, chant for Sheeta. And I just – I developed these bonds with people in the wrestling ring. And then Colton came in with me. And me and him and dad started doing it as a trio. But the thing about it was, is not only were we being like a good crowd member, but me and Colton got to study every single person individually. We got to mm -hmm. study Kenny Omega's moveset. We got to study the Young Bucks. We got to study FTR. So now in our career now, we know everything about you guys. So it was like kind of like a study session for us. We get to sit back and go, yeah, we know how to get out of that or it, whatever it was it was just we we got to study our competition at the same time so that was a benefit well that's really cool let's let's uh back up a little bit when there were happier times with your dad obviously mm -hmm. growing up your dad's a legend no question about that what was it like growing up as the kids of billy gunn did you have an opportunity to travel with him at all do you have any great road stories uh tell us about that yeah so we were uh Sometimes during the summer when we had school off, we were allowed to go with him. He would take us on the road and me and Austin would just be in the ring goofing off all the time. And I remember Vince used to walk by and be like, get the hell out of the ring. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> he was mad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but we got to interact with everyone backstage and we knew him all personally. And at the time, it wasn't a big deal. Like we had, that was just work, dad's work. It wasn't anything special. And I remember one time in second grade, I took his tag team championship belt in for show and tell so i was mm -hmm. i was pretty cool but going back to that like we weren't really allowed to watch wrestling that much like it was the attitude era and we were young and my mom was you know little sheltered for me and austin you know tried to keep us sheltered so we weren't really allowed to watch it so when everyone's referencing back to these moments and matches we're kind of like yeah man sure <laughs> like because we don't really know and uh, another funny thing is we used to have to do the suck it, but we could never say it, but we used to have to do it like up here if we wanted to do it. You know, because, <laughs> yeah. So those yeah, are some growing up, it was like, uh, yeah, like all the happy times of like going able to like visit dad on the road was also really special to us because we're in this huge arena and we're like eight years old, 13 years old, and we're in there wrestling with other wrestlers and, um, and Colton, you should tell your Dustin road story, but, um, I remember being at a pay-per-view, I think it was over summer or it was over Christmas time and we were able to go to the building and, and big show, Paul White at the time. Um, he's like our uncle. So uh, at the time, we always got excited to see him and he was like, hey, Merry Christmas, come out with me to my Escalade and help me get my bags. We were like, oh, this is sweet. So he opened up his trunk of his car and it was the brand new Xbox. It was a brand new PlayStation. And then in front of them was stacks of games. Wow. He was like, Merry Christmas, guys. So uh, being eight and being 13 and then Paul White is bringing us and buying us Xboxes and, Xboxes and PlayStation. It was like, that's sick. Like, that, like, we just felt at home and beating up The Rock backstage and beating up Stone Cold Steve Austin and getting free merch and like, it was just like a field trip for us. And it was just a, super cool to be at the building. Colton, That's what insane. is the story with uh, Dustin Rhodes? Oh, yeah, so he, I, yeah, used he, to, I, <laughs> I used to despise Dustin Rhodes after this. But we were, <laughs> uh, we were in the ring one time and me and Austin are just wrestling around. And he grabs my legs and does the Claudio big swing. Oh, and, no. And, spun, and I'm a little kid. So he spun me around like 20 times. And I was just so sick and so dizzy. And I literally like just despised him from then on out. Probably <laughs> still hold a grudge to this day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you came up to me. You came up to me the first week you were assigned and you were like, hey, you know, you want to hear a story about this, this guy? I was like, oh, dude, what? You've been holding a grudge for that long? All right. Man, cool. Never forget. <laughs> Uh, never, forget. Oh, never forget every everything eventually comes back in wrestling in some way shape or form so yes, yes. uh if you ever wrestle claudio they're just going to be like ptsd like oh god no 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 
<laughs> I may just walk uh-huh. out of the ring just straight. To yeah. yeah, just like just <laughs> nope. walk. Nope, done. we're done. Yeah. Uh, I, we, we've been talking a lot about wrestling, but I want to talk about uh, Austin about your uh, reality show that you did mm-hmm. uh, a couple months back. The E series, relatively famous Ranch Rules, which aired uh, January of this year. Uh, Saddleback Ranch in Colorado. Uh, talk about being cast in a reality show and that whole process. Uh, well, actually, a fun fact, me and Colton were battling for the last spot Ooh. on the roster for that show. So wow. we got wind of it. We got wind of it. And we were like, you know what? Let's do our interview. So we had to do an hour interview each. And when I went in my interview, I was like, I'm single. I will do anything. I love to get my hands dirty. And I freestyled for them. I went, this hour interview was insane. I was freestyling. I was doing everything possible to try and get this gig because I knew it would be a lot of fun. It was a break from wrestling. It would transition me to a different uh, platform and it would just expand AEW's image and I could represent them. So, yeah, I ended up getting that last spot. And um, I was gone for a month in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and I had the best time. I love being out there. My dad obviously rode bulls when he was younger, and we were surrounded by that lifestyle of being around horses and being around a ranch and and getting our hands dirty. And and me and Colton worked in worked in construction early on in life after high school, so like we we know what it's like to put in hard work and and um, get the reward from it. So we were trying to get this this. Uh, this ranch back on its feet after the pandemic and during the pandemic and they're going through hard times. So, uh, yeah, I quickly found out my castmates were all from LA. Uh, they didn't want to, they didn't really understand that concept of putting in hard work as when it comes to like labor and I, getting sweaty and getting your hands dirty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, I love them to death, but it was like pulling teeth out there. So I just became just the guy that uh that did everything and i didn't mind that role at all i love being on camera i love being the center of attention and if that means that i have to do hard work to get there then that's what i'm going to do so so colton how did you feel about uh seeing austin on tv in that role and would you consider doing reality tv and if so what show would you want to be a part of um so i watched the first two episodes and then i couldn't watch it anymore (laughs) just because like i was just watching as like they tried to turn austin um hana i guess her name was into like a love story and i was like i can't watch this (laughs) i just just couldn't watch it um but super proud of him for doing that i mean it's kind of scary to take on a reality show but um i think i would do one i would just be the bachelor uh, you know that's just that's, that's all the girls fighting for you <laughs> yeah that w- that doesn't sound too bad <laughs> no it's a it's a reality that's real show different. that's not any different than real life huh right right hey. it's the most reality <laughs> show oh so great um i i want to go back to something that you had mentioned in our last segment colton you used to build houses in la i did so, so i so, um, tell tell us about that yeah so i started working construction for my stepdad when i was like 14 And that is like pouring concrete in the Florida summers for three months. Like, yeah, once high school was done, I had to work every single day and pouring concrete and tearing stuff down with bulldozers and all that. And I did that every summer. And by like 17, I was leading the crews and driving the trucks and got so then I went to college. And um, when I graduated, I was trying to be like a financial analyst and so I, <laughs> I had all the interviews and I was at the final interview and I was like, <clears throat> I had my life planned out. Like I was going to be a junior financial analyst for a fortune 500 company, just work my way up. I'm just going to stay that route. And on the final interview phase, I was like, I don't know if I can sit at a computer and just do Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> like I just can't do that. So I went back to the construction world and I was pouring concrete with two, a double major in finance and applied economics, I'm sitting out in the oh sun God. pouring concrete, but someone drove by and was just looking at the plans of the house. And I was like, what are they doing? And they like, they control the whole neighborhood. They make the schedules, they deal with the customer. I was like, well, can I do that? And so I just applied for that job and I got it. So I worked in Florida for a couple of years doing that. And then I moved to LA with my ex-girlfriend and I was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll try it again. I somehow got into like the custom world. So I was building houses that were three stories. They all had elevators. 
Um, I had a few LA Lakers players in my neighborhood, um, a few NFL people, CEO of like Snapchat. And I was just like, <laughs> I don't know how I got this, but I had two assistants who were older than me as well. And I was in charge of the number one um, revenue comp- like subdivision in the country for that company. So wow. I was, yeah, I was doing pretty well out there and that's how I got into it. And I was doing that and then gave it up to be a wrestler. <laughs> Man, it's very Nothing stressful. Wrong with that. Yeah, it's very stressful because you're dealing with like a hundred people on a job site, and you have eighteen houses going at once, and they're millionaires who own these houses. So it's just you have to deal with you know all walks of life, and just it really puts it's a very skill on how to deal with certain types of people and how to manage everything, and it's actually helped me a lot in my life because you have to deal with conflict and talking on the phone and meeting people face to face and being professional and knowing when to push people it's just it was actually very beneficial to me i think that's super that's, awesome yeah that's yeah. fascinating and it, it, another thing that i want to talk about that's fascinating because you know we see you guys on tv as the guns professional wrestlers very successful talented but then you also do amazing things like that and then austin you do amazing things like having this rap career which you know a lot of people may not even know. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into that, about your album, about perhaps your future goals with it? Yeah, I think uh, just growing up, I, I I used to freestyle over the radio. And, and one of my friends one time, we were down by his dock and 50 Cent came over the radio. And I was like, you want to try and freestyle? So uh, I just started freestyling. I became very good at it. I was like, oh, I like doing this as a kind of sense of therapy and a way to get out my emotions, whether I'm happy, sad lonely, whatever it is. It's just, uh, I would put on that style of beat and I would just kind of just let my mind wander and let it go. And over the years I started figuring out garage band when, when, uh, the Apple computer started coming out and Mac and you could do it yourself. And I was in college and I had a little closet and I would wrap my blanket around it and have my mic hanging from a hanger. And I would be sitting there with my, my MacBook in my little closet, just like rapping and do, trying to, trying to make a song. And then over the years, I just found out about studio time. And then one of my friends, Safe Love, that I have that that collab EP with, just he started freestyling me, with me every single weekend. And just like, it was a sense of therapy for me. And then I started going into wrestling and I was like, man, I still do this every single weekend. Why don't I just like come out with a couple freestyles or things that I've been sitting on for, for years? I wrote those things back in 2016. And it was just, I finally did it. And I received so much love from my freestyles and they were like, Oh, I wanted to hate this so bad because I hate you as a wrestling character and you win <laughs> wrestling, but I'm not, I'm not kidding. You're, you're actually pretty talented. So I was like, I was like, all right, it's like two avenues. It's like, I have my rapping and my wrestling people who enjoy my music and people who enjoy my, my wrestling. And then there's people that enjoy me watching me pick up poop or in artificially inseminated a cow on reality TV. And it's just like, we do so much behind the scenes, not just wrestling. So, um, yeah, just my wrestling career, uh, it, it, it comes first. And uh, when it comes to music, it's something I still still do every single weekend with with uh, my buddy Safe Love. And we just recorded a song. Um, I sent it to Colton um, last weekend. And I have another freestyle that I'm writing right now. So it's just, it's just when I have time, I'll, I'll do it um, and release it. But for now, it's just wrestling is, is always come, always comes number one. So you both are just so multifaceted and have crazy backgrounds and i already had so much respect for you but now i have even more uh we're talking to austin colton of the guns the firm here on AEW unrestricted and coming up we've got lots and lots of fan questions And we are back here at unrestricted alex aubrey and austin colton the guns the firm boys, perhaps, saying that out of respect. Careful Guys, it's been a lot of fun. Hey, hey, I think that's a positive thing, being known as a firm boy. No? Yeah, I, I don't mind that. I don't mind okay. that at all. As long you as you don't add so the other the word gym. between yeah, exactly. it, we're good. Yeah. All right, very good. Well, <laughs> we've got some great fan questions for you because obviously uh, uh, you've got a lot of fans. Is so there what ever are the questions? Great fan questions? I, I have a good one here. We're going to start off with one. <laughs> what they're going to be about. Well, this is a good one. So Travis Hatmaker wants to know, who were your favorite wrestlers growing up that were non-family members? 
Um, I'll go with Stone Cold Steve Austin. There we go. I feel like that's a cliche answer, but I mean, how can you hate the glass shattering and then him just stunnering everybody in his path? It's hard to hate. (laughs) True. Yeah, I uh, I was a big fan of Shawn Michaels. I loved his energy. I loved his goofiness at times. I loved him in uh, the DX era. It's just uh, I think he re- re- I relate more to Shawn Michaels. I think uh, when it comes to my energy in the ring too. So like growing up, uh, I love Shawn Michaels. Obviously from our gear, it's inspired by him. Um, <clears throat> and then I think when I started getting into like the student aspect of the game, I think Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning is somebody that I really, really focus on now. So it's, um, yeah, those two were definitely very influential in the Austin Gunn character, if you want to say that. I love it. Uh, we got a question from Rory Loves Wrestling. If you could face any team from history, who would it be? <sighs> is this a, it, yeah, is this a non-family member <laughs> question too? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, yeah. yes, let, let's, hear, let's hear both. Let's hear both. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Colton. I mean, New Age, New Age Alice has to be number one. But if we're not going family members, um, oh man, maybe just like the Road Warriors, so they could just bounce us around. Oh everywhere. my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> just, dude, like, we're not coming on, the, dude, we're not coming on that alive. Dude. No, we might have to retire after, but it might be just fun just to see them throw us around everywhere. <laughs> It might be no, no. I know that would probably be getting beat up in that match. I refuse. He's got a point. No, the He's got yeah, a point. the New Age Outlaws. The New Age Outlaws is is pro. I would love to see me and Colton go against them in their prime. That would be unbelievable. Um, and I think our other one that we wanted to check off our bucket list was FTR. And mm. um, I don't think that story is uh, finished yet. So I hope it's not. Yeah. Awesome. Hopefully not. So Jeffrey Barry wants to know, what was it like growing up with your dad and training with him? Oh, he is I'll a... go first. I'll go, go first. Go no, 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 no. I'll go Uh-oh. first. Uh-oh. I'll go first. Here's the because worms again. I got, I got brutalized when I went through training. It was just me and dad in a warehouse, one ring, and he beat the shit out of me for three hours because that's how he learned. <laughs> <laughs> and I respond very well to that kind of treatment. I grew up in football. I got recruited for lacrosse. So I'm very used to coaches being hard on you. But I'm the type of athlete that, oh, you want me to do that? All right. I can't wait to prove you wrong. I'm somebody that learned something one time and I'll never make the mistake again. So it's like he was very, very hard on me growing up or growing up in this like when I was training and golly he did not take it easy on me one whatsoever but when colton got in i got to watch how he was trained and he was coddled baby baby (laughs) well i I don't i don't make the mistakes i don't have to get the shit beat out of me you just say it to me and i'm good (laughs) yeah yikes me and colton learn in very different ways uh so i just got to see the difference between uh us getting trained by him he wasn't but, coddled i was just kidding but it was just like <laughs> it was very different but also I, in my dad's way of training is very no nonsense so even in the gym you consider that training like we are going oh, yeah. to the gym and we are working out very hard and there's no debate i don't care how you feel how much sleep we got like that's what's happening and it's the same way in wrestling and i mean yes he is very understanding and tells you why and lets you make your own mistakes but if you're wrestling, like this is a hundred percent and you're giving it your all. And this is why, you're, you know, it's very, I guess for lack of a better term, no nonsense. He is pushing you to be the best that you can be. And I applaud that and want it. I wouldn't want it's, it any other way, to be honest. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things like in the moment you're so heated and you have so much frustration or you have so many emotions running through your body when you're trying to learn something new or learn concepts in the ring or learn new moves. But like as frustrating as it can be, you go, you just look back like a month later and, or like a year later when you finally understand the concept and you look back and you go, that's what he was trying to teach me. Now I understand it's, uh, it, you can't learn it unless it just clicks in your head somehow, some way. And he knows how to make it click in my head. He knows how to now make it click in Colton's head. So it's just like, 
it, when he was training us, it was, it was very frustrating at times. You want to punch him in the mouth, but it's just like, well, you can't cause he's six, six, two sixty. but, um, <laughs> yeah, kick your ass. Good point. But, it, but yeah, but it's also just super frustrating because you're, you're in a mental battle with yourself. You're in a mental battle with him. And it's just like, you're trying to understand and trying to get on the same page. And then when you finally do, you have so much respect because it's just like, ah, that's what he was trying to teach us. I think one of the things I like about working with your dad as a coach backstage is that he doesn't like talk about really what you did well. He'll just be like, that eh, was good. And then immediately goes into like the constructive criticism of here's how you make it better. And I always feel like that's a really great person to have in your ear because he's one of those like, no, here's how you make it better. I'm not going to tell you, you know, you're the greatest ever. Or you're awesome or blah, blah, blah. Sure? He's not going to like, no, he's, he's definitely just like a that. hard ass. You will never get that from him. And I know that like not everybody likes that, but I feel like personally, I love it because I feel like that's that's what it's got to be about. Right. It's about that's and I see that's that a you lot in you two is is he's kind of instilled that attitude of like, OK, cool. Yeah, this was great. But like, how do we make it better? How do we get better? How do we be the best tag team? How do we be the best wrestlers? Because you're you're obviously going to be tag team champs one day. So what are you going to do now to get to that point? So, I yeah. And I, like I think it. what going off that, that, that point is there's no sugar coating. He raised no. us to have thick skin mm -hmm. and be able to take constructive criticism and not get hurt about it. Not being, not being butthurt about it or being upset or cry about it. It's like in this business, I want to know what I'm doing wrong and how I can make it better. And some people do not like that. They want to, they want to be told how great they are so they don't have to change anything or they still they still walk around like this, like, ah, I might have messed that up, but it doesn't matter. I'm still the best. Like, we don't like that kind of treatment. We've never been raised like that. And uh, he does a very good job of like, I mean, I can't even count the times on my fingers that where he's been like, oh, hell yeah, that was great. Nothing I can say. No, it's not like that. It's like, I know you thought it was good because he, tell, he tells you in certain ways, in his own way. But mm -hmm. then like. I want to know what I did wrong and how I can do better. How can we make this the best storyline or how, how can we be the best wrestlers we can be? Yeah. And I remember actually after that dumpster match we have at the acclaimed, he, um, he oh was like, God, I love that match. He said, it was good. Enjoy it. We'll talk tomorrow. <laughs> like, <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. That's, that's definitely Billy. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, great question here from Jay Bakes. Uh, have your wrestling career goals so far lived up to what you thought they would be? So I will go first here. Um, I haven't been doing it very long and I just set one goal and we actually, it was so funny that we did this today, but we actually watched my first match yesterday, me and Austin. And oh. then we watch, then we watch like the ending of like the Jurassic Express match. And it's only like a year apart, but the, leaps and bounds we've taken as a team and as performers is insane. And sometimes you need that just to sit back and realize how far you actually have come and just to take it in. But my main goal when I entered was for me and Austin to be tag champs. And we haven't met that yet. So I can't say that we've met our goals because that's the big one. That's the, that's the one I want, like me and Austin to be tag champs. But as far as like happy with our progression, very much so. Awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think piggybacking on that, when I got into this business, uh, I think dad just since I just loved the physical aspect of it. I love entertaining people. I love being, I loved entertaining like kids because I come from an elementary education background and that's what I majored in at Rollins. So it's like, I got to do everything at once. I got to entertain the crowd. I got to, I got to sign things and meet kids that look up to me and I got to just be in front of people and cameras on me and show off and be athletic. And my dad always told me before every match when I was growing up or like when I first started getting in, he's like, go out there and just have fun. So like when Colton got into it, I didn't really have a goal of mine. I was just like, I am having so much fun. I'm wrestling with my dad who's still one of the best ever to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm now kind of as a younger brother. And now I'm like teaching and watching my brother wrestle and, get into the business and go through the roads that I like he's doing things that I used to mess up on or like he's doing things that oh I, I remember being there so it's like a weird dynamic at first but I was like I was like I'm just having so much fun and now that we're getting a little more serious about our our stuff and our craft and and how we want to re be remembered 
the tag champs are are now number one on my list. Yeah, I had fun, but now maybe people weren't taking us as serious as I as I wanted them to. So now, as we take this new direction with the firm, and are surrounded by people that are just as hungry as us from day one, now I think that's that's me and Colton's goal. It's just I want to wear the tag team champion belts. That's that's a fantastic that's answer. I mean, a great that's goal. Where you got to go. Great, great goal. And I, I really hope that like, I mean, I, I love those boys too, but it would be really great to see you guys take the belts off of the acclaim just because I feel like that there's, I don't want that story to be done. I think you but guys like, all have amazing chemistry. Like we'll you see. said, everything in wrestling all comes full circle. And if, if we, if, if they still hold it, we get number one, uh, we just got to be in that number one place. We have obstacles to get through in order to get to them. So, and you will get through take them. It one You've step at a time. Gotten through so many obstacles, and I'm so happy that we finally had you on this podcast. Three years too late. Uh, I know Colton wasn't even in wrestling three years ago, but I'm like, it's three years too late. We definitely needed you guys on. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank you guys for being here today. Thank you, Austin and Colton. You can follow Austin Gun on Instagram and Twitter at the Austin Gun, and you can follow Colton on Twitter at Colton Gun, uh, and he's the Colton Gun on Instagram. You can follow and listen to this podcast, AEW Unrestricted, for free, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of your favorite podcast apps. You can watch the video version on YouTube. Just search AEW Unrestricted. Dynamite, TBS, Wednesdays, Rampage, TNT, Fridays, Dark and Elevation, uh, Tuesday and Monday, respectively. This is Aubrey Edwards and Alex Eberhentes, along with the guns the That's guns it. i almost Get said gun right. club, but i'm getting go. better i'm getting no, better no 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 <laughs> breaking habits is hard thank you for listening to AEW unrestricted